Hello, uh, welcome to Finding the Fallen. This is a, a very personal account of the work I was involved in um, not very long ago now it, concerning the recovery of human remains from the Western Front, uh, very largely as far as this talk is concerned from France, but also I was involved in projects at, um, in Belgium as well. But, but for now, let's have a, a look at where we begin. Uh, and really where we begin is, I suppose, um, in the aftermath of the Battle of Waterloo. 60,000 uh, dead and wounded, a battle that lasts little more than a few hours. Um, unbelievable carnage, but for the other ranks, the private soldiers, there was nothing in terms of an honoured burial. They went into mass pits and tourists, uh, tourist guides in the many months and years after the battle would show how many bodies there were in those pits by jumping up and down on the turf, making it basically quake. I'm being very careful not to make a hole in the turf because apparently, um, not surprisingly, it was very smelly. And uh, it is worth saying that some of the dead were then actually exhumed very deliberately for two purposes. One, to provide dentures. Um, literally, their teeth were taken out and made into false teeth. And the other thing that happened is, at least according to one account, uh, the bones were burnt um, and then brought back to the UK as fertilizer through Kingston upon Hull. So nothing like we'd expect from a modern war. And of course, the casualties of the Great War were far higher than initially imagined. There were early attempts to allow officers to be brought home at the family's expense. And then really by 1915, the decision was taken that everybody should be equal in death and buried where they fell or as close as possible in a cemetery and here we've actually got a chaplain uh, laying out stones round a grave of a fallen soldier on the Somme. Um, this is of course true of both sides, this uh, cemetery here is a, a German cemetery uh, but of course for many soldiers like this soldier here of Beaumont Hamel is that their death was not quite so orderly uh, many, many people were simply abandoned, covered over in shell holes and trenches, or in this case, actually, it would appear this body has been moved, slid down into a trench uh, using a shovel uh, to make a more interesting photograph. Um, ghoulish, but, you know, it's a different world in many ways. Um, however, whether that man was ever identified is another question. And we're now in a situation where we're talking about the fallen, who are then the missing. Why are they missing? Well, not because they're blown to bits or vaporized. It's actually because they're simply impossible to identify with the technology available in the early part of the 20th century. So we get the great monument here at Tsipval, 57,000 names of the missing. And bear in mind here, this is not the Canadians. This is just the, the missing of Britain during the period of the Battle of the Somme. And there are others equally large, uh, Tyne Cop being one in Belgium, and of course the Menin Gate itself. Um, and I became involved in archaeology um, in a, a roundabout way. I'd been working actually in the France, uh, excavating a set of trenches in the back garden of a house and tea room in Ocean Villas. But during that process, we were approached as a group of amateurs in some ways. Everyone else was professional, but not me. I, I'm the historian, never done this before, other than working for two men in a trench. Um, actually, would we go and work at a site at Serre? And as soon as we begin that, my role was very straightforward. It was basically identifying the finds, not identifying the individuals, that's beyond my skills, but actually who was the person? Were they British? Were they German? And also at times, what period of the war had they died? Um, because of that, we were very lucky. On one occasion, a farmer came across a complete set of human remains, handed them in in a crate to the War Graves Commission, very close by at Bahrain near Arras. And when I was asked to go up and have a look, we found an identity tag for an Edward Bergman actually amid the remains. Had that farmer not got off his tractor and picked everything up, 
he would have remained one of the missing. As it was, he was handed over to the German War Graves Commission, the VDK, and they were able to actually give him a burial um, on the border of France and um, Luxembourg, which is where the, the open cemetery is. We'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, but at the time, we were very interested to see what had been done elsewhere. Everybody else, as you know, before you do any archaeology, what you need to do is look at the grey literature, see what there is. And this actually is a, a mass grave discovered near Verdun, which was deliberately targeted to try and find a French poet, Alain Fournier, who fell in 1914. Uh, what they discovered here was really quite ghoulish. It would appear that some of these guys actually had been bound and had then been executed. But because the Germans had left everything with the bodies and because of the German, the French system of identification, Alain Fournier and many of his colleagues were actually identified. Um, and then we worked alongside Alain Jacques, uh, one of the great archaeologists of the Western Front. He's based at Arras and working here at Gavarel, found Germans. Now, the thing to say about these Germans is that unlike our 1914 French soldiers, who were very often identified because of their red trousers stain their legs red, the bones actually go red. Here we've got soldiers from 1916 or later. Why do we know that one? One, the gas mask canisters to the steel helmets that don't come in to the very middle of the war. The very thing I was interested in, you know, how could I actually assist in the process? So let's remind ourselves what might happen to casualties. Here we've got a group of soldiers that have been killed in combat. It looks to all intents and purposes as if every single one of those actually has died where they were shot. I suspect not. I think they've been moved and dumped in the trench and what the next step would be, particularly in hot weather, would be very rapidly to backfill the trench. And then this is what you then excavate when you're working. Here we've got a soldier on the Somme lying in chalk, wearing a pickle halb from early in the war. Uh, they don't last very long because they have absolutely no ballistic qualities whatsoever. But by looking at other people's work, we were able to refine some of our techniques before we began work. And one of the things that we discovered was there are a lot of actual misconceptions about this. When these bodies were discovered by Alain Jacques, these are members of the Lincolnshire Regiment, you'll notice that the right arm of the men nearest to us are actually overlying the left arm of the man immediately to their right. And the assumption was from journalists and from other people that visited the site that actually they'd been linked um, in death, like some vast hokey cokey. In fact, what it demonstrates is that the bodies have been placed in the grave, starting at the left hand end and working off away from us. Um, and that's why they're overlaid to get as many men in as possible. You'll also notice, by the way, that the boots survive. The boots virtually always do. And it is worth saying that, among other people, the Israeli army put identification discs in boots because they survive virtually any form of trauma. There was a bit of a peculiarity to this burial insofar as, again, an assumption was that somebody had very carefully organized body parts into their correct anatomical positions um, and put them in the grave. Well, actually, this grave is very shallow. And talking to Alain Jacques afterwards, although the story went out that people had done that, it seems unlikely, that actually had been a shell strike directly onto the grave, which is why we have that peculiar organization. So you have to be very open minded. But everybody I've ever dealt with treats these people as individuals. We have been accused by some people of treating them as specimens. That's not the case. We are doing everything we can to ensure they get the honored burial they deserve. Now, some of you may be aware of the work that was done at Fromel, an Anglo-Australian battle a disaster 
that occurs in the early part of 19, uh, July 1916, a diversionary action for the Somme that fails completely. And as you can see here, uh, the bodies were photographed by the Germans in the German position after our soldiers, the survivors, were driven out. But using Australian money and a lot of pressure from Australia, what happened was a change. And the big change which affects what we do is that after this project was begun, they began using isotope analysis and DNA. Initially, the British War Graves Commission would not give permission for that to happen. Perhaps more accurately, I should say MOD wouldn't. And that was a factor which we'll come to in a minute with some of our early work. Um, and these guys literally are as they were found. But what the Germans do here is I think because of the weather and because of the number of bodies, they buried them actually in mass graves. A series of six pits were dug, big ones, to take over 400 casualties. And then they were then photographed being backfilled. Um, and in fact, the Germans used a light railway to move them. Uh, those bodies actually were then exhumed as part of the project. So bodies buried in a mass grave were exhumed and then the process of identification went on. They then go into a new cemetery. Now, it is worth saying that according to the War Graves Commission, if somebody's buried in a war grave, you can't exhume them. So we have here a situation where the morality, the legislation, the rules are changing as we're working. And this is us actually working on our initial project at Ocean Villas here, excavating a trench system running through someone's back garden. We did not at this point contemplate finding human remains. But within a few months, we were working down the road. The village of Serre is up the road to the right. And the road that we see there runs back towards Malay Malay and back towards Ocean Villas. And what we got here was a request by the BBC for the series Meet the Ancestors to actually try and find a dugout occupied by Wilfred Owen in January 1917, about which he writes the poem The Sentry or Blinded. And what we've done here is the sort of protocol you don't have to use on a Roman site. We've got an archaeologist, a single one, working then with our bomb disposal expert. And just out of interest, off to their right, well, we've actually got what appears to be a half crater that actually is a mine crater blown on the 1st of July, which is still visible. And we're looking here for a German trench system and we're looking at it right next to Serre Cemetery number two, uh, the biggest cemetery on the Somme, uh, built clearly after the war. Uh, we were based in the little chapel. Curiously, that chapel was built to commemorate a battle, not of 1916, but of 1915, the Battle of Ebuturn, a French assault that established the trench system that we're now working in. And here we were very, very fortunate that actually what we had is a trench system that showed up as a white trace. You can see it directly behind our German uh, colleague, who actually is looking into the hole. If you look, there's a curving white line behind it. People who visited the site said very knowingly, ah, that's because after the war, the French farmer backfilled the trench with chalk. Could not have been more wrong. The reason that our trench is full of chalk is that actually on the 1st of July, 1916, as the British attacked this position, known as the Heidenkopf, named after Captain Hyder, Actually, they blew four defensive mines under the road and the falling chalk backfilled the trench. In the television documentary, uh, one of the people narrating it says that this is the trench that Wilfred Owen would have walked through. Well, that'd be very clever because actually he would have to have been there at least six months earlier to walk down that trench. Uh, there was actually a second trench dug. 
We found an entrance to one of the mines that was blown. We actually found the entrance to the gallery. Uh, actually, uh, my colleague there is holding a German stick grenade. Uh, we actually found four of them in a box at the top of the steps. And here, Colonel Robinson, an expert in mining, is clearing back the steps that would have led down to the gallery going under the road. And the cars, you can see, are parked on the road. But as we worked, virtually the first thing that we found was the beginning of human remains. And for me, my experience of this was someone saying to me, what do you think those are? And I said, are they sticks? And he said, no, they're bones. Actually, they're collar bones. Is he British or German? And I remember saying, I have no idea. He went, no, Andy, look at the buttons. Sure enough, they were German. He wasn't a Bavarian. They have distinctive buttons. He actually then was part of one of the many kingdoms that made up the German army. And here are the three people who are going to work on him, including a Belgian archaeologist, Yannick de Gris, is working on him. And we had a, a team that stayed with him throughout the process. Now, at this point, I need to say we weren't able to start work immediately. We had to call the gendarmerie. So the police could turn up and say it wasn't the farmer's wife that we'd found. And we had to tell the War Graves Commission who came down and gave permission to get on with the project because we knew what we were doing. It was going to be done ethically. Uh, by the way, you'll see that he's actually lying in an area which actually is quite clay. That's going to be quite key in a minute. Uh, chalk is on top of the body, but he's not lying in a chalk. Um, and this is what we'd found. Uh, the head had been ploughed off as far down as the collarbone. And there we've got a belt with actually a buckle, ammunition. And in fact, when we went through the ammunition pouches, we found that this soldier had overfilled his ammunition pouches. In other words, he'd either not been in action very long or he'd just arrived when he was killed. Cause of death was impossible at that point to determine, but what we were able to do was eventually fully expose him. Note the boots. Note also the fact that at basically what mid tibia uh, position, we've got a number of grommets. Those are from a German shelter quarter called a Zeltbahn. It's a tent or um, a ground sheet, if you like. And typically, German soldiers having been wounded or killed are moved in their ground sheets. So what we've got here is a soldier not lying where he was killed. And also, if you look, his arms are slightly flexed, suggesting actually he's been held under the shoulders as he was moved into place. But key for us was round his neck, he actually had, well, in the middle of his chest, not round his neck, was the remains of an identification disc. And I am a visiting lecturer at UCL. We had agreement with the conservation departments at University College London that anything that we could bring back that was ethical could be brought back. Uh, it is worth saying, by the way, that if you look at his left arm, you can see buttons which will be on his cuff. Those buttons are in a line which are horizontal rather than vertical. These are called Swedish style cuffs. Doesn't sound very important, but in terms of knowing the uniform, knowing what he's wearing, are very, very important. Obviously, we have no helmet or hat because that's been ploughed off, but there was no sign of a respirator, a gas mask. Now, that might have been taken by one of his colleagues, but it's worthwhile saying that his pocket contents were there. He had a little blue enamel lid from a jar of what we think was leather uh, treatment um, for his equipments from a company called Bruning and Brothers in Stuttgart. So was this man a Württemberger, but he's wearing a Bavarian belt buckle, naughty. We know he's actually got Swedish style cuffs. Who was in the area? We started work. And what we did is we made contact with Ralph Whitehead, now the author of a multi-volume history of the 26th Reserve Corps on the Somme, and he was able to start the process of helping us work out which soldier this was. 
in the end we had two sets of german remains and also one british soldier and this actually shows the um morgue at borain with those bodies now notice that the british soldier actually is in a miniature oak coffin the germans are in cardboard boxes why because they're going to be handed over to the volksdeutsche griesgefallen the body responsible for dealing with german dead but they don't have an office or representative in belgium or france like we do um, for reasons we'll mention in a few minutes um this is luke luke barber who actually put himself in the position to show exactly where our soldier was lying as a way of understanding what was going on notice the flexed right arm and also notice that a visitor has already put a little wooden war graves commission cross next to where the body lay within a day we had another body now this body was in a different place it was actually on top of the chalk the chalk upcast i mentioned therefore had to have been from a soldier who died after the 1st of July or on the 1st of July. Luckily for us, he was wearing a shoulder title and it actually was the King's Lancaster Regiment. This man had three candles in a pocket and he had suffered major trauma. He actually had a fractured right um, femur smashed completely you can probably see that and also a very very smashed skull next to him is what's called a silent picket a screw-in picket that was normally used for barbed wire we did wonder whether that was used as a temporary grave marker but it had now fallen over bearing in mind that this area would be fought over throughout all of 1916 into 1917 and then again in 1918 so these battlefield graves would not last very long however they were marked and on virtually our last day of excavation this soldier turned up lying on his side he actually had been slightly damaged by previous work but he was wearing silver lace on his collar, which survives remarkably well, silver always will, which indicated he was an unter officer, basically an NCO. But notice that actually the chalk is once again on top of the body. So this man has to be pre 1st of July. Again, no helmet, although we've got a skull, no anti-gas equipment. Was this soldier therefore from early in fighting on the Somme or could that have been earlier you'll also notice that actually at mid uh, um, uh, hip level basically just below the legs we've got a scattering of those fittings from the German Zeltbahn so we can say this guy has been moved into the position and laid in a sort of sleeping position uh, with him by the way he had a watch that stopped at 10 past six he had a harmonica, I mean, incredibly uh, 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 iconic, really, isn't it, for the Great War, but also um, had a Neolithic flint scraper. All of these items had originally been in his pockets or bread bag, and um, there was an awful lot of fly pupae as well, which suggested he'd been on the surface quite a long time. By the way, because of the Neolithic flint scraper that was actually in his possessions it wasn't on the ground when he fell or when he went into a grave he became the archaeologist and the question then was who was it well mr hemmington was very helpful gave us permission to bring certain items back to the uk we then went here we went to tipa mentioned it already i said 57,000. it's actually 72,000 names on there the missing of the song and we went to the panel that actually had the names of all of the missing of the King's Lancaster Regiment. And all the team took it in turns to read out names in blocks of 10, just to ensure that his name had been said. I don't think many of us were particularly religious, but we felt it was very important that we did that. And then the work began. Now, because the attitude at the time of the war graves commission this is pre-formel was no isotope analysis no dna 
basically a cemetery, sorry, a grave was prepared a few yards from where he was found. The successor regiment came and everybody from the regimental sergeant major through to the youngest soldier in the unit carried his, his coffin to the grave. He was then placed in a, a grave as an unknown soldier of the King's Lancaster Regiment. Now, we'd done everything we could to narrow it down, but there was over a hundred men missing on a single day, the 1st of July. They were part of a, a wave that attacked and were beaten back. Basically, never there again. It has to be that one day. At the graveside, two families came up and said, we think it is a great uncle or a grandfather. What did we know? Well, we knew his height. We knew what regiment he was in. We knew he was used to hard physical labor, but that was it. They will never know whether that was their relative. A few years later, and I feel very guilty about this one, then they could have offered provide DNA and we may well have had a named soldier rather than an unnamed soldier of the King's Lancaster regiments. Uh, and there he is. And it is worth saying, by the way, that as a team, we paid for a red rose to go on his grave. It irks me slightly because I'm from Yorkshire, but nonetheless, it's the right thing to do. However, back in London at UCL, work proceeded apace. And what we actually had here was a situation where the dog tag, ID tag, we should call it really, but the Germans called them dog tags because Prussian dogs had to have a tag around the neck to show that they'd been licensed, existed. And what do we have on it when it was cleaned? And by the way, in one piece of filming a few years ago, I actually saw an amateur archaeologist take one of these, spit on it, and rub it with his thumb and said there's nothing on this well there wasn't when he'd finished but what we had here was a quite badly corroded id tag reserve regiment number no number number seven company personal number should be three digits we had one digit we had two at that point had i been there so-called expert that i am i would have said well i'm afraid that's it actually the South Korean students didn't know that, so she turned it over. And she turned it over and began clearing it. And what we've got here is evidence of a naughty soldier. Basically, German ID tags are meant to be anonymized. The German military system will know who he is and what his regiment is, but if he's captured, very difficult to decipher. It gets much, much easier if the owner of the ID tag gets something sharp and scrapes his name and home village in the back. And what we had here was what we thought was Hunes, H-U-N-E-S. There is no German name Hunes. There is, however, Hunes, H-O-N-E-S. And actually, if you look very carefully, we've got J-A of Jakob, Jakob Hunes. And above that is the name of the village, Munchingen, a village just to the north of Stuttgart, almost within sight of Bruningham Brothers. Was this too much of a coincidence? So all we did is we didn't mention the company. We didn't mention anything. We asked Walter Rapp, was there at any point lost in the area we we're working a Jakob Honnes? It took him about an hour. He got back and said yes. Jakob Honnes, 121st Reserve Regiment, number seven company, personal number 228, lived in Munchingen, a farm laborer. Then he said, I believe there's actually a little museum in Munchingen, now quite a big suburb of Stuttgart. I'll get in touch with them. And what we then got from Alexander Brunotta at the museum was this. And this is a photograph of members of a platoon in number seven company of 121st Reserve Regiment. And the man lying down on the left hand side, wearing those Swedish style cuffs. The man behind him, by the way, has got Russian cuffs. Actually, short beard before gas mask came in, you could have a short beard. 
And behind him, sat also with Saxon style cuffs, is another soldier who looks quite similar. The reason for that is that is Jacob Honnis's brother. And what we discovered was he was killed in the fighting in June 1915, the Battle of Ebuturn. His body had been taken into that little uh, chapel to wait to be collected by the War Graves Commission. And his brother behind him, slightly to his um, left, is Christian. Christian wrote to Jacob's wife, Maria, and said, I buried my brother. I hope to go back and do a better job. Christian never managed that because this is the village of Miramont. This is the rest area for the regiment. He was wounded in fighting in July 1916, died of his wounds and was buried in the village of Miramont. Uh, by the way, it's worthwhile saying that in the photograph as well, there's a bicycle. And that's quite important because Jacob was the secretary of the Munchingen Cycle Club. And it is worth saying, by the way, the cycling was distinctly left of centre in the early part of the 20th century. And the entire village turned out in the 1930s to be very anti-Nazi. I don't know much more about him than that. The key thing was his wife remarried. Sadly, her husband was to die in Soviet prisoner of war camp just after the Second World War ended. But we'll come back to that in a few minutes. Um, this is the house that he grew up in. And this is the monument to the regiment mentioning his name. Because wonderful thing, TV money, in some ways it can be quite corrupting, but in other ways it allows you to tell the full story. And here we were able to go back, meet the family, meet also, very, very importantly, see the war memorial and get more background information. And the man that we met was Walter Rapp. Remember, Maria remarried. He was therefore a indirect grandchild, I suppose. And the key thing was that actually what he did is he then went to the local newspaper and did a write-up with the help of a journalist. But what we knew about him also applied to our other fallen soldier. It looked to all intents and purposes as if he died at roughly the same time and been buried in the same place under our chalk layer. And our German soldier had a bank book with him. And that bank book actually was in Halberstadt. Halberstadt is up near Hanover, nowhere near Stuttgart. So what happened was Walter got this article written, got a lovely write up for us, the No Man's Land team, described what had happened about his grandfather and then said there was another soldier. Did anybody know who this man might be that came from Halberstadt? Well, actually, it wasn't difficult. Walter, um, sorry, my apologies, Ralph Whitehead in the US went through the list of fallen and found a direct connection between Halberstadt and one soldier. His name was Albert Tielicke. He was an Unter officer. Remember what I said about the silver lace? He also died in June 1915. He died fighting the French. He was in number seven company of 121st Reserve Regiments. This article then went out in the Süddeutsche Zeitung and it was seen by a lady who actually was a member of, wait for it, the Tielicke family when she went to a rehearsal of a play. It was actually a, a, a play, would you believe, about the First World War by George Bernard Shaw. She then went home and said, I've been shown this article. Is it possible, Carl, husband, it's your relative? He went, I'll have a look. And this is our Unser officer photographed before going off on mobilization. 
You'll notice, by the way, that the actual photograph is very discolored. That is a result of bombing in 1945, when the house in Halberstadt was bombed. One of the only things recovered from the ruins of the house was this damaged photograph of the man's son. Um, so we'd got both of them perfectly. We'd failed with a British soldier, but we had our two Germans. Um, and this is then a Carl Tielicke with Allison, uh, and then the partner of Albert, uh, uh, who actually did all our work in Germany. And we went to Halberstadt, saw photographs of the house, bearing in mind, by the way, destroyed in bombing in 1945, went to the local church, and I then had the opportunity to go to the burial. And the burial occurred in a village called Labri near Metz, nowhere near where they fell. Unlike our British soldier who went straight in a grave almost next door to where he fell, went with his mates, these two guys went hundreds of miles away. Why is that because we're being cruel? No. There's an odd irony that there was a very, very well-funded War Graves Commission for Germany after the First World War. Bodies could be returned home if people wanted. But in 1945, the new government, when it came in, said no more money for War Graves. Many of those individual separate burials were then put in mass graves, which some people will be familiar with at cemeteries like Freecourt and elsewhere. And more importantly, if a body was found, they would be brought as close to Germany as possible. But at least these two guys here went in and we had an honor guard formed by a group of paratroopers who were there for no other purpose than they'd volunteered to use their leave, German paratroopers, to look after the cemetery. So if anybody ever thinks a German cemetery doesn't look as well cared for as the War Graves Commission Cemetery, that is simply because of funding and politics. And then what happened was the decision was taken by Walter and by Carl that there should be a little monument close to where they were found. And this is still there to this day. As soon as I can get out there, I'm going to clean it up again. And when it was unveiled, the French closed the road. How about that? The farmer came. Everybody turned up in numbers. There was a brief ceremonial. And there, Guillaume de Fonquer, the director of the then historial, the then director of the historial in Peron, said, Andy, this is the only monument of its, life, of its kind in the Western Front. I said, why? Because it's little. He went, no, because it actually commemorates two German soldiers and one Brit. There is no other that I'm aware of. And that unique monument is there. And as you can probably tell, still not happy about not being able to give closure to the British family, although we did very, very well with our Germans. But then something very strange happened, and that is that actually Walter Rapp, my apologies, Ralph Whitehead, the American author, is a big collector of postcards. And not long after we'd put up the monuments and, and Ralph had been out and seen the site, this postcard turned up. And what we've got, basically, here lies 40 of our fallen comrades of number seven uh, company, Regiment 121, Reserve Regiment, June 1915. But this is a trench. Hang on, what's this mean? What this actually means is that they'd used the area to one side of the trench. We happen to know it was the back of the trench, the Parados, to bury their fallen. Now, did we miss 38 others or had they already been found? Did we find the last two? We don't know. We only were able to excavate in a week a relatively small area. But had we not found... Uh, the two guard casualties, we would never have known what that postcard meant, because we might have assumed they were buried in the bottom of, of the trench. Uh, that was very often a French practice. You know, we now know what the reality was, and we're able to give closure to two families. Now, basically, 
with the information that we've got, we then got another TV series. We then went up a little further north into the area of mines and mining. Some of you might recognize what I would call a slag heap. And we began work in an area threatened by developments on the edge of a crater field. Those trees are actually in craters. And we had chalk once again, and we made a mistake. We were working in October. We were leaving site when it got dark, getting back just after dawn. And when we got back on day two, we had been raided. People had come in with metal detectors and they'd come in with uh, lamps. And it was a scene of devastation. Luckily, we'd only taken the topsoil off. They were able to get a rifle or two. And I'm afraid to say rather badly smashed up the remains of one soldier. They'd taken his insignia, so we could never know who he was. But on our last day on site, I was moving some blocks of chalk that looked like they'd been used to fill in the top of a, a dugout steps. And I put my hand down, having heard a snap, and I had a handful of human teeth. It was a set of very handsome um, uh, front teeth and immediately stopped called people over and we began work on what we'd actually discovered was a, a mass grave. These guys showed signs of trauma. This man here, you can see, has a hole in his skull, nothing to do with us or farming practice. The soil was very clay, so we had everything from woolen garments through underwear, through braces, they were all there. These guys were two Prussians in the top layer, Russian buttons, and below that, layer after layer after layer of soldiers who, in fact, came from Bavaria. Um, and this was the somewhat ghoulish scene as we went down, uh, bearing in mind that we did have a lot of organic survival. Ultimately, we had five, virtually five sets of uh, human remains. Uh, you recognize now the boxes, um, and these ones are being laid out for analysis. But because of the nature of the soil, we were able to produce not just our five burials, but also some wonderful finds. Now, it seems odd to mention them as wonderful finds, but this is the entire back of a Bavarian tunic, red piping, buttons, everything. And on the front, rather more fragmentary was, would you believe, the ribbon of the Iron Cross second class, still fastened with a safety pin. It had not been sewn on. It hadn't been awarded very much earlier. And then in a pocket, a field postcard posted from Munich, 25th of September, 1915, to Leopold Rothermel, a corporal. And what we then did is we then got to work. And clearly what we needed to do then was speak directly to Munich. This is an outside Ralph's area of expertise. We also found inside the same book, fragments of a songbook, in this case, with a lovely connection here to Elvis Presley. Uh, one of those songs is the song Wooden Heart, which Elvis Presley learned when he was a soldier serving in Germany in the American army. And we went to the military archives at uh, in Munich. Now, it is worth saying that although the British lose a lot of our service records in bombing in 1940 in the East End, which many people curse the Germans for, the RAF managed to bomb the entire records of the Imperial, of the Imperial Prussian archives in 1945. If you want to know anything about your ancestors, whether it's World War I or back to the medieval period, forget it, they were destroyed. But luckily for us, the archives of Württemberg and indeed Bavaria were not housed in Berlin, and they survived both world wars. Result was we were able to then work on our casualty and work out exactly who he was. And he was Leopold Rothermel, 
and Leopold Rothermel was a concert violinist. He had a military exemption. He was the concert meister. He had no need to go to war whatsoever. He had done his military training, but was exempt. But his brother Otto was killed in September 1914. He decided, I suppose it was his duty to go or to avenge his brother. I don't know what you think, how a, a, a violinist would do as a soldier. Within a few months, he was a corporal, not a bad promotion quickly. He sets up a band within the regiment. And very, very importantly, he also then begets the Iron Cross second class for bravery. They really don't hand those out with sweeties. You know, you have to do something. So it was a very good soldier. And in that archive there, we discovered that he was killed in early October 1915 in a counterattack by the Germans to try and recapture a trench that they'd lost. And it said he died from a gunshot wound to the stomach. Not a, a, a nice way to go. There probably isn't a nice way to go. But we were unable to find any members of the family. There were no Rothamels at all in Munich that we could find. And then we discovered that when we went to the location of his parents' shop, his mother ran a tobacconist, his father was a jobbing electrician, we found a memorial to RAF bombing in the Second World War that wiped out the entire city block. Did that explain why we didn't find the Rothamels? Uh, I don't know. But the point is here, if you touch one war, you will always find another. And we had failed to get out all of our fifth body. We were asked the War Graves Commission, the German War Graves Commission, not to bury him until we could get him out. We went back, TV money once again, the intention being to remove him. We'd marked where he was very carefully and completely backfilled, as you imagine. As we worked, we had rather more people available than we'd imagined. And within a few minutes, here we've got Luke Barber again working with John Price. They both spotted, once the earth was removed, what they said was a grave. And we had to then get on with it. And here is our soldier, my height, six foot, and um, lying in a grave that someone else dug for him. And clearly, whoever dug it for him didn't bury him because he's buried the wrong way around. It's been dug to be wider for his shoulders than his feet, and obviously buried in the dark. But this man, actually, complete mystery. We don't know who he is whatsoever. However, round his neck, three rings. One, a typical souvenir of the Second World War, First World War, I should say, Flanderen, written on it, Flanders. And then two rings, 1883, wedding bands one martin one becker these were exchanged on betrothal therefore were they actually his rings well no he was in his 30s had to be his parents tv people said oh well how was he therefore an orphan we said i think quite forcefully we don't know we need to do more research and we went back once again to Munich. And here we have him being born in May 1884, the year after um, the betrothal and wedding. And here we have him as being Alfred Martin. And then his father is Albert and his, wife, his mother is Maria Becker. And it says he's buried or lost at Labri, which is exactly where we found him. And it tells us that his cause of death is Geschlotten Kopf shot through the head. And sure enough, the head showed massive destruction. Uh, by the way, in 1915, um, um, uh, the, the Germans at that point did not have steel helmets. And frankly, and it's not a joke, you really don't want to be six foot tall with no steel helmets. Um, we went here to the village, which is Altenkirchen in the Pfalz. And we were able to go to the record office, discovered more about the family. Of that we'll give you in a minute. And we also found then his name on the village memorial. 
Alfred Martin and his date of death. We were then told that the family still lived in the village, were farmers, but actually were on the Baltic coast on holiday. I didn't go, but my colleague went all the way up there, uh, David Kenyon, and when he got there, he met the family, he had the rings, and basically said, do you want them back? The VDK said, it's all right. The father refused to touch them and said, no, he was, quote, a bastard, the black sheep of the family, you keep them. Oh, but we thought perhaps he, you know, was an orphan. No, it turned out that Maria was much younger than her husband and having obviously family problems, ran away with the teacher. At that point, the father, Albert, decided it was a really good idea to get a girl pregnant, had to marry, but to do that, his wife had to be written out of the records because then it was then said that she died, which provided the problem, solved the problem of bigamy. I don't think she, he then got on very well with either his father or with his stepmother. And at some point actually managed to perhaps inadvertently bankrupt the family when he didn't bring in the harvest when he should have done. There was a storm, it was destroyed, and he was thrown out. So why did our soldier, our corporal in the Bavarian army, buried in a grave dug specially for him, very unusual, on the battlefield where he fell, probably sniped, why did he have the wedding rings? Well, you can imagine the father saying, your mother was a bad lot, so are you, get out, I never want to see you again. And three generations later, still remembered as being the black sheep of the family. So that is my very personal experience of Great War archaeology. We've done more since, well, there's more to do. Somebody once said that a death in war is like throwing a pebble into a pond. The ripples go out and they come back and they still affect. Uh, with the backdrop of where we are in Ukraine, all of this seems very prescient. But it is worth saying that in all cases, when we've spoken to um, German family members, they have said for Germany, war was a disaster. It ruined our family. And you can see that directly with all of these and their stories. But their stories need to be told because we're talking about people who were doing their duty in a war which actually, unfortunately, was not the war to end all wars. Thank you for listening.